Hello, welcome to St Nicholas Church, Tuxford. I'm Greg Price, I'm the priest in charge of the Tuxford Benefice. It's a group of five churches which includes this beautiful church in Tuxford, St Nicholas's, and also a church in Weston, West Markham, Normanton on Trent and Marnham. I'm going to explain a little bit about the history of this church in particular and the area in which we're based and the context. And later on we'll be looking at some of the key features which Tuxford affords for people who are visitors, but for us who live here, who see it day by day, sometimes we can forget the depth of the history which this church is based. St Nicholas Church has nearly 900 years of history. And as we go around, hopefully you'll be able to see that the church has developed and grown as the community has developed and grown and as it has prospered. And here we see the spire, which actually was added on to the tower later. And inside we'll also see that the, uh, the roof which was pitched became a castellation with lots of clerestory windows along the side. And as the congregation grew, as the Lord of the Manor endowed uh, the church, then more and more things could be added to. We've even got a, a chapel which is called the White Chapel, where the Lord of the Manor, his family, have a vault under the floor, and that chapel was dedicated for their family. As you can imagine, it takes money to run churches. And over history, the Lord of the Manor would have endowed the church with a church farm together with a rectory and a vicarage where the vicar could work. Some of them are really massive and over the history they've mo people have moved on from one building to another. This one over here is the very first vicarage uh, and it would have been attached to the church farm. It would have had places where servants would have been because they would have worked the farm. People would have gone into service and helped with the housekeeping, with the cooking of the food, looking after, after the farm so that it could not only fund the vicar's post, but also it could fund the church. Because the church is a living entity, it's not just a, a building, it's people it needs to develop and change as the people and the, the community we live in changes. This is the first of three vicarages. The second vicarage is even bigger. And next door they built a Sunday school building where they could train the young, poor workers' children in education and in the Bible and in works of God. And people have forgotten that actually that was the basis and the seed and the beginning of our national education system. The church was also responsible for hospitals. And in this place, way back, even before 1179, when the first vicar was appointed here as the rector, there were a group of monks here who had a chapel of ease, a small place where people who were travellers up the main road, going over the ford, which we'll see a bit later, and they provided hospital care, they provided food, they provided a place of shelter. And that became our National Health Service, the catalyst, the seed of that. And even our, our legal system with the magistrates, it's interesting that looking back through the history of this church, when the magistrate used to come on a circuit, he travelled from place to place, he used to meet with his assizes inside the church building. And up the road, not far from here, there is a lock-up, which was the prison where people were kept until the magistrate came. This building is really interesting in that it's one of the very first grammar schools in the whole of the country and it's immediately over the road from the church you'll see on the right hand side at the front even the old school bell is still there and right next door to my right is the the second vicarage uh, which one of the previous rectors was even somebody who taught within that grammar school so the church was so intrinsically bound up with educating young people developing understanding about not just the word of god but helping people to move on Everything is located within a hundred yards of the church, which was seen as the focal point and the centre of the whole village. As you can see from this vicarage, it's very leafy, very large, and reflects, as I said earlier, about the number of servants of the people that would have been working to support the church uh, in the early centuries. As you see from this sign, originally erected by subscription in June 1897, which was refurbished and replaced in, in this location, right in the centre of Tuxford, uh, for the Queen's Golden Jubilee. And it's very interesting because it shows the significance of the old A1, which was the Roman road, because it's the main London to York road, and also to Lincoln. Lincoln, of course, was significant in history 
because the Bishop of Lincoln ruled over the, most of the north of England and used to collect taxes on behalf of the government uh, and the king of the time. And so it shows the significance of where the church was with the monastic system before the Reformation, but latterly with the main trade routes with the A1. This, this black and white building here in front of us is the old Newcastle Arms Hotel and this used to be the main A1 road. As you see the cars going to the left and right at this junction, that was the old Roman road which went up straight up to the north and just to the right of it round the corner is where the post office came and all the mail would go up and down this road day by day and it was quite a focal point and an important uh, hub for all commerce and industry. Further up along the road there's a, a tall house which we will see later which was a brewery so they used to actually make beer in Tuxford and take it all the way up to Doncaster and further. This is the old marketplace with the associated buildings with the butter market and this is where they used to hold market in this community week on week out. The interesting thing is again the church is central to the market because when it was raining they used to go inside the church to have the market. It's interesting that as the church has developed and grown, there have been many movements moving for the church, particularly the Oxford movement, where Victorians wanted to raise the altar so steps were put in. They also wanted to make it more ornate. But then there was a reaction to that, and some of the more Anglo-Catholic features were removed. In fact, part of the church was a very ornate carved stone reredos of the Last Supper. And that was moved out of the church and hidden for many years in the butter market and it was rediscovered in the 1940s after the war and replaced in the Whitechapel. Even after the First World War, there was a reaction to what the horrors that the people had seen during that terrible war. And the altar and the rear dress were replaced and they were dedicated to remember a butcher's boy who became a hero during the First World War. And there's an inscription on the front of the altar to remember the sacrifice he made from this community. This archway here is right next door to the post offices and this is where the coach and horses would have come to collect the mail and the goods which have gone up the A1. That history is still carrying on with the mail being delivered and collected from this very place at the post office today in 2015. As you can see, this is a very low entrance pace here, so this is where the horses would have been brought through this archway and round to my right, where they would have been fed and watered, and a fresh set of horses would have been ready to take the coaches further on up the A1. The Newcastle Arms now is Sally Mitchell's art gallery and it shows many photographs and paintings and artwork and brings lots of people into the community. The sepia photographs here, particularly of Tuxford, they show different vistas through the history of Tuxford and how it's developed with uh, motorised vehicles and horses. And also, it, you'll notice from some of them, some of the dress that people were wearing. It's also interesting that these photographs are from the Eric Coddington collection. He used to collect lots of photographs and he was a long-standing and well-loved benefactor of St. Nicholas's Church in Tuxford and a pillar of the community. Here you can see that Tuxford has its own jail called the Lockup. And because this was the main Great North Road, the modern A1, it was notorious for highwaymen. And this is where the highwaymen were brought, waiting for the magistrate to deal with them. It's also interesting, it says on the plaque here, that in 1850 workers known as navvies started to build the local railway. Uh, and these men worked hard and played hard and were known for their drunkenness on payday. And another reason why the lockup was necessary. It was bleak and horrible inside and was a bit of a deterrent and was used up to 1900. This is the old schoolhouse which originally was for the Sunday school and was built actually in the garden of the second vicarage. And behind me is the modern day Tuxford Primary Academy. And you can see on the plaque on the school it was 1877. Uh, and this was when the 
church handed over education in lots of cases to the state. Then they built uh, schools and also the state schools like this one, where it was built right over the road so that there was still a link between the church and the school and education. And as you can see, even over the doorways, there is a doorway for the boys and another for the girls, because in those days, boys and girls were educated separately. Nowadays, it's co-educational. Immediately over the road from the butter market is uh, G&D Halls, a news agent, and they've been delivering news here for over 100 years. It's interesting, they've just read on the front of it, which makes it look really uh, beautiful. There's a photograph of a young child reaching up for some sweets, and I remember when I was a child going into a traditional sweet shop and getting caught four ounces of this and four ounces of that. My favourite was chocolate honeycomb and rhubarb and custard. Because this shop is immediately over from the butter market, it's got quite a history and it's central to what happened in Tuxford. And in one of the windows is some of the history. For example, in 1701 there was a fire that started in Newcastle Street and burned down practically the whole of the town. And Queen Anne authorised a collection of arms throughout the whole of England to rebuild Tuxford. It was also well known for its malting and making beer and brick making. And later, uh, with the coal mines, the railway became significant and lots of people came to Tuxford to either work on the railway but latterly they worked at Marnham and the other power stations along the River Trent in building and running them. So even today, many years later, there's lots of people who have come from the northeast of England who actually came here as part of the industry that moved into the Tuxford area. Tuxford Wimmer was built in 1820 and has been refurbished more than once and latterly in 1993 and as we'll go and look in, in a few moments they have restored it to working condition, they still grind flour and oats and there's a lovely little coffee shop next door which is very popular for walkers, bikers and people who visit the area. As you can tell from the name Tuxford there obviously originally was a ford and here we can see the ford. It's very small now, but that's because the whole of this area was actually so waterlogged because of the clay content in the soil that some engineers set about to drain this whole area. And it was quite a magnificent feat. Hence, around Tuxford, there are some old brickworks where they used to make bricks from the clay. Uh, and the water from this ford now is still being drained even to this day and there's a reservoir at the top of the hill which is opposite the uh, windmill which drains the water and keeps this area relatively dry. This is the other side of the road and as you can see it's quite a narrow stream. At well, one stage there was a torrent here, there was a massive river and bit by bit over the centuries and over the years it's dried up or been drained away or diverted. And I've been praying for this community for a long time that the Lord would once again open up the spiritual wells of salvation. And it's very interesting that as I was looking at the maps of this area as I became priest in charge, I found that not far from here there is a holy well which the monks would have used as they helped the travellers over Tuxford. It's also a, a very interesting fact that we are in the middle of Sherwood Forest. And it's interesting that much of the myth that surrounds Robin Hood and Sherwood Forest even comes to Tuxford. Local history is quite mixed about Sherwood Forest and Robin Hood, and even Tuxford has its own legends based around Friar Tuck, and perhaps that's why we got the name Tux Ford, Friar Tux Ford. And as you can see, even today, there are remnants and signs that show us the immense engineering feat that was conducted by the people in the history. This is a reservoir of tank which still siphons off and pumps away the spare water from Tuxford to keep it dry. Standing on the top of this windy hill just overlooking Tuxford, as far as the eye can see, you can see windmills, you can see the power station. The old A1 is now a, a modern bypass. And in the very far distance, you can just see Lincoln Cathedral, which is the highest point from Tuxford right the way over to the coast and further on across Europe, Holland, all the way to Russia. I'm just looking over in the distance at the power station and it reminds you of the scripture which says that let your light so shine before men and all around is the darkness and the greyness of the clouds and there on beacon on a hill is the city of God lit with Jesus at the centre.
here we are inside Tuxford Mill. For a large part of its life, it shared the site with a twin Fantel post mill, which was recited from a local village in 1876. The tower windmill itself was badly damaged in the 1920s, and the sale were put out of action. But later on, uh, this together with imposing cheaper grain from America and the emerging large industrial flour mills led to two mills gradually falling into disuse. The post mill was finally dismantled in 1930s. In 1982, the Ostick family from the East Midlands spent 12 years restoring this mill and uh, is now fully working. And in 2005, the windmill was purchased by Paul and Fari Wyman and they're carrying on the tradition of milling and they've opened this beautiful mill to full working order and they run a fantastic coffee shop right next door. See the grain hopper and goes between the, the two stones. That's a significant piece of wood, that, isn't it? Look at that. It is. It is. So it comes with the stones. Yeah, the bottom stones there, and the top one's just spinning on top of here, and it'll come down the chute into the bag. Fresh wholemeal bread from grain from around here. Yeah, uh, from down there, Grantham, we get the grain from. Excellent. You can't go better than that, can you? The exciting thing for us who live in Tuxford is that we have a working windmill uh, which grinds flour and oats even to this day. And even in the landscape of the old windmill, we can see in the distance, and even on the outskirts of Tuxford, modern windmills that are generating electricity as part of our eco-generation security plan for the country. I'm looking forward to the time when the third great awakening comes and as we look at these windmills and the golden uh, oiled seed that's in front of us it reminds you of that scripture about how the harvest is white ready to be harvested but the Lord needs to send work into the harvest the Holy Spirit is waiting like the Ruach of God the breath of God the wind of God to sweep through our nations through our communities through our homes and set us on fire with love for him and my prayer for this church, for this community, for our nation and for the nations around the world is that our hearts are open to receive the fullness of what God is desperately wanting to share with us, that he loves us. And if we were the only one who was alive on this planet, he would have died for us because he loves us that much. So open your heart, open your mind to receive him as Lord and Saviour in your heart and he will bless you beyond measure. This tall house here used to be the brewery and as you can see it's quite a tall house which is a comparison to the short ones either side. And over here is the archway which used to lead down to where the dray horses would be and on these three little cottages at the side here were the malt houses where they actually made the beer. As you can see from these three cottages here they were quite short and they've been raised with more brickwork so they can have a pitched roof so they can be turned from malt houses into dwellings. 
and these are located just right next to the tall brewery building and through an archway where the dray horses would have come to be looked after the stables at the back and it's right on the Great North Road. St Nicholas Church is nearly 900 years old. Records show the first rector was here in 1179, but it's believed that even before that there were monks here who used to have a chapel of ease to help people who were travellers along the Great North Road, the modern day A1, over the Ford in Tuxford, and they used to provide hospitality, medicine, support, and also food and lodging. Just here we can see that, that, that at the entrance of the church is a font. This particular one was built in 1662. And most churches have the font near the entrance to the church because this symbolizes how to be a Christian, you need to come into the presence of the Lord Jesus, repent of your sins, and be washed of them through water of baptism. This one particularly has a baldachin or cover which suspends from the ceiling which goes quite high in the church. And the scripture is around it, Suffer the little children to come unto me, for such is the kingdom of heaven. Because it's really crucial that we come with childlike hearts, ready to receive the King of kings and Lord of lords into our lives, so that we can become the transformed people that he always created us to be. As you can see from this plaque here, it lists the rectors and vicars from 1179, starting with William. And originally this church came under the auspice of the Newstead Priory and Abbey. It's very interesting that in 1358, uh, you notice from the plaque that it says vicars. And vicars were people who were vicariously put in charge of parishes on behalf of the rector who would be elsewhere, and sometimes they were given huge swathes of land and multiple parishes to look after. Later, in 1546, um, the parish moved over to Cambridge University and Trin Trinity College, uh, and under their auspices. And so there is a, a, an amazing history of all the different people. And th the thing that struck me when I became the priest in charge in 2015, and my name was added to this war, was the history that this place holds. And for me, the Christian witness in this place, you know, for nearly 900 years, from when the monks first came here and set up a community here to help the travellers over Tuxed Ford to today. And I've been praying consistently that those wells of salvation are opened so that, like streams of living water, the well springs will bubble up and this community will be set on fire once again as it was when the first people came and were missionaries to this community. As you can see around the church, the place is full of Union Jacks and displays, which is 70 years since there was victory in Europe. And as the priest in charge, for me, the most important part is, yes, to celebrate the victory, but to remember that millions of people laid down their lives so that they gave up their tomorrows so we could have a today. And for me, it's really important for me to share with this generation the cost of us having the freedom we have today. This is the St. Lawrence Chapel. And this is a place where people could come for prayer and also a place where we pray for those who are persecuted Christians around the world. When I first came here, I looked at the stained glass window up there and I thought, well, why is that stained glass window? Why is he holding the washboard? And I wasn't quite sure, so I went away and did some research and found, actually, it's not a washboard and fits in with this carving here, which so shows him on this bed. And it looked like the biblical story where they dropped the bed through the roof. But actually, when I did my research, it showed that St. Lawrence, who is the patron saint of beggars, poor people and travellers, which fits in with the monastic heritage of this church, he was actually martyred by being griddled to death. And so this little chapel, I felt, was a, a good place for us to pray for those Christians who will not deny Jesus so that they can stand and be strengthened by God the Holy Spirit and that they, that they will know that they're not alone because as St. Lawrence laid down his life and as Jesus laid down his life for us, we are 
in a small way, remembering and standing with them. The church also has gone through lots of changes over the years, not least in the Reformation. And uh, over in the corner, you can see the uh, remnants of a statue, um, and which has been chopped in half. And one of the things that happened was the, they call it iconoclasts. They went and smashed any image, any statue that had a face on it or could be seen as idolatry because it was a big reaction to the control of the Roman Catholic Church uh, at the time of Henry VIII. The church over the years has developed and grown and as the community has become more prosperous or more people have moved in, the church has grown and developed along with it. Uh, we, we had a, a north aisle added, then a south aisle. If you look up, you can see how the, even the roof has changed. Originally being pitched, you can see where the level in the stone is and where it was squared off with clerestory windows along and a hammer beam roof to extend the height and also the prominence of this church on the hilltop. Also later was added the spire on top of the tower. So as the church grew and developed, the church itself developed and grew to accommodate the status of the place, but also the number of people that used this building. The church for hundreds of years in this community has been the centre. Here we see a tapestry which was made in 2000 for the millennium, which was made by members of the church and the community working together. There are different materials, different wefts, different stitches, and as you can see, the church is a focal point on this one. At the bottom of this tapestry, you'll see that there are different colours and strands and levels. This represents the strip field farming that we can be found at Laxton, which is nearby, and where in history... The barns were attached to the houses in the village and each of the farms had a strip of land which they used to farm. Over at Laxton is the last remaining example and around the time of the millennium, Her Majesty the Queen actually bought the land to protect that unique farming system and the way in which it's done for the nation. This tapestry shows the industrial past the industrial future, the industrial presence of Tuxford. And here is the power station, and many people were brought to Tuxford in this area by the coal industry, by the brick-making industry, but also building of the power stations. And here in this tapestry, the second of the series of two, also made for the millennium, it shows how significant they were for this community. And even to this day, there are families who started their life in the northeast as Geordies who actually live in this community, Scots and lots of different people. So Tuxford itself is a, a hybrid of many communities that have come together based on the type of industry that we have, which is local.
and this is what they discovered in the butter market. This carving on the left-hand side showing the birth of Jesus, in the centre showing the Last Supper, and on the right-hand side showing a carving of Jesus being taken down from the cross. And it was agreed by the White family that it could be placed within their chapel, beneath which is their family vault. I'm just thinking of the craftsmanship of this carving alone. We're very delighted that it was preserved so that other people can enjoy it as much as we do. Jesus took the bread and broke it and gave it to them said, Take, eat, this is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup and after giving thanks to his father he said, Drink this all of you for this is the blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Very costly. Yes. Incredible. To, I could, I'd hate to think how much it would cost to get somebody to carve this today. Yeah. It's incredible. It is beautiful.